the cry from the heart is still there. No, make that the gutter someplace deep within our capacity to process grief and heartache. So that it rises up in a tsunami of untrammeled emotion. I am referring, as musical theater aficionados may have guessed, to the storied first act finale of Dream Girls. The 1981 Broadway musical that made its absurdly belated British debut on Wednesday at the Savoy Theatre, the London premiere has no shortage of Americans. Not least a blazing leading lady in Amber Riley from the TV series Glee. Her character is the discarded lover and singer Effie White, who is responsible for the anguish-laden aria and I am telling you I'm not going. That catapults a stunned audience into the intermission. That role was first taken years ago by Jennifer Holliday, whose exploration of the most intimate recesses of pain remains seared on the memory of those who saw the production from the director-choreographer Michael Bennett, who would die of AIDS-related complications just a few years later. Under Bennett's matchless eye, Dream Girls moved from beginning to end as a sustained kinetic entity that folded even Robin Wagner said into an unstoppable fluency. The rotating towers of light that dominate Tim Hatley's design at the Savoy pay fitting homage to Mr. Wagner's original aesthetic. The initial staging remains a daunting act to follow. And one can only marvel in retrospect that neither Bennett's direction nor the show itself won. That season's top Tonys, the directorial duties on Dream Girls have now fallen to Casey. Nicola, the Book of Mormon, Aladdin. An admirer of the original whose work here nods in Bennett's direction without quite equaling. That achievement because, frankly, who or what could? What Mr. Nicola can very much do is ramp up the entertainment value of Dream Girls by tweaking it in certain ways. Its composer, Henry Krieger, now 71, added several songs for the 2006 film, so drawing from both the movie, for which Jennifer Hudson won an Oscar in the role of Effie, as well as additional material by Willie Reel. This Dream Girls forges an identity that allows a story of shifting musical styles from a bygone era to appeal to a new generation that has its own pop idols. How appropriate, then, to have plucked Ms. Riley, best known from her work as Mercedes Jones in Glee, a show about aspiring performers, to here be given the stage opportunity of a lifetime. And the company has a second breakout performer in Adam J. Bernard as the James Brown like Jimmy Early, whom the galvanic Mr. Bernard catches in glistening yet scary free fall. Effie is a plus-sized vocal powerhouse who is jettisoned from a 1960s girl group. The Dreamettes in favor of a sleeker, more streamlined replacement. In a narrative that has often been interpreted as the history of the Supremes, a dynamo who does not readily accommodate the word no, Effie must endure the ascent at her expense of the Diana Ross like Dina Jones, Lisi LaFontaine. The women share a fierce second act number, listen. An Oscar nominated solo for Beyonce in the film, which the two singers here do proud. This iteration of Dream Girls plays up the solidarity in sisterhood more than ever. Perhaps because of the emergence since its 1981 debut of female-driven musicals like Mama, Mia, Wicked, and Mr. Krieger's own hugely compelling sideshow about conjoined twin sisters and premiered earlier this fall in London. For all that Ms. Riley seizes and holds the spotlight as required. One never loses sight of the collective implied in the title, which includes the piercing voice to be in a bojack as Laurel, the third member of the rechristened Dreams and, like Effie, nobody's fool. Mr. Nicola, the show's guiding force, is not Michael Bennett reincarnated, nor must he be. This Dream Girls proceeds more as a series of self-contained numbers, the feral, step in, too the bad side among them, as opposed to the seamlessly choreographed whole that back in the 
they left the impression that New York's Imperial Theater was primed for takeoff. Greg Barnes's costume design comes with whiplash quick changes that prompt a double take. While Hugh and Stone's lighting allows the visuals to carve out their own terrain in what in lesser hands might remain in oral triumph. Michael Bennett sits atop the list of directors who changed our very perceptions of the theater. It is also possible to say much the same about Eva Van Hove. Even if one can't quite imagine the Flemish innovator getting down and dirty in the realm of showbiz that remained but not thematic and actual home throughout his too brief career. On Monday night Mr. Van Hove, the recipient of both an Olivier Award and a Tony for his abstract and merciless reinvention of Arthur Miller's A View from the Bridge, opened a scarcely less bruising production of that Ibsen stalwart Hedda Gabler. In his national theater debut, starring a full-throttle Rev Wilson, Luther, the affair in the title role of the general's daughter with a penchant for pistols. The production runs through March 21st in the Littleton Auditorium. It will be shown in cinemas via NT Live on March 9th. Performed in modern dress, the cast as often as not barefoot, this Hedda returns Mr. Van Hove and his inestimable designer Janvers waveled to a play he directed off-Broadway in 2004. That one had a text by Christopher Hampton. This version is by Patrick Marber. Of closer renown. It's difficult to imagine a company better attuned to its directors and compromising take on an 1891 classic that here transcends time and place to address the power dynamics within and without the confines of marriage that drive had into despair. A first-act meltdown merely hints at the emotional and physical carnage that will ensue by the final curtain. Spoiler, think lots of onstage glop. Ms. Wilson locates in the unhappily wed Hedda a level of self-awareness that offers precisely zero solace, and the excellent Kyle Soller deserves credit for finding in the husband, Tessman. A fundamental decency that allows this character for once not to seem a jerk. In a class of his own is the scorching Rafe Spall as an implicitly bisexual Judge Brack, whose apparent looseness does not prepare us for the toxicity he conveys in a chilling climax. That leaves Ms. Wilson's ruinously intelligent head of nowhere to turn. Small wonder this ever remarkable heroine speaks at one point of having no talent for life. But it is the audience's good fortune to be in the presence of a vibrant theater maker with a determined talent for art.